Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Winning Minds. Uh, we are delighted to welcome today author Sena Desai Gopal. A brief introduction about the show itself, uh, Winning Minds is uh, powered by Women Inspiring Network, uh, which is an inspirational storytelling platform. The whole idea is to bring together ideas, stories of women um, achievers in a paid forward movement so that we uh, bring the stories of achievers to the next generation of women uh, aspirants and um, like, you know, create a paid forward uh, approach. Our platform has garnered more than 20 million views uh, since its inception during the lockdown. And Winning Minds is a series which is looking to document the work of uh, content creators, uh, whether they are um, authors, journalists, uh, writers, um, uh, bloggers, vloggers. Um, like, you know, we've had a bunch of uh, people across the various sectors of the arts on our show. And again, the whole idea is to see how women who are bringing together passion and purpose and commitment into uh, the creative pursuit are doing it and learn from their journeys. Uh, so let me with that introduce uh, Sena Desai uh, Gopal. Sena is a journalist. She specializes in science, medicine, food, travel. Uh, she's been published widely across the Boston Globe, The Atlantic, Modern Farmer, The Times of India, among others. Uh, she was originally from the southern part of India and now currently lives in Boston. Um, the book that she's written is really interesting. Um, it's called The 86th Village. And, uh, you know, there is today, like, you know, there is a blurring between fact and fiction. So we have news which has become infotainment and, uh, you know, journalists or news uh, writers, uh, reporters often use techniques of narrative description to uh, bring impact or emotional appeal to the stories that they tell. And similarly, fiction is equally borrowing from the real world from real events, from places that trigger uh, certain thoughts, and then like you know, um, roots that story, not just in imagination, but in the reality of the world around us. And Sena's book is one of those uh, like you know, kinds, which uh, brings together elements from uh, sociology, ecology, the political landscape, uh, and a lot more into the narrative uh, fiction form. Uh, the common Commentary that she's received from many people uh, has been around how the harsh reality is really informing her novel and how uh, the novel is at once like in a suspense, uh, suspenseful and heartbreaking. So with that, let me just uh, welcome Sena. Sena, delighted to have you here. Thank you, Amrita. It's a pleasure to be on this show and I look forward to us chatting about this. Fantastic, Sena. So, uh, Sena, uh, before we begin into uh, the book itself, uh, it would be good to understand, like, in a little bit about your journey. Uh, you do mention uh, that uh, you know you grew up in southern India in a setting not too different from the setting of the book. So, uh, like, you know, tell us a little bit about, like, you know, you're growing up and what, um, like, you know, like, uh, uh, inspired you to have a creative bent in life. Um. So uh, growing up in, um, you know, in southern India, in a part of southern India, which is uh, expected to drown, 175 villages expected to drown on this um, huge mismanaged government project, uh, a dam. So I did grow up with that. Uh, it's like a sword hanging over, you know, my head, um, hanging over the heads of all these people that would be displaced because of the dam. So I did grow up with that, but really, you know, it used to upset me, but I don't think I took it really seriously as a project um, until, you know, uh, I decided to uh, do a master's in environmental science and then in tropical agriculture, because I was interested in knowing how these communities are affected by a project of this magnitude. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I understood it as a journalist, but I could not write about it as a journalist because I'm one of the people who's affected by this and there's no objectivity here. It, you know, I can't be objective, right? So I just took all that information and turned it into fiction. So the 86 village is set uh, in a, a, the setting of the 86 village is, is just uh, the real thing. It's, it's journalism, it's reporting, everything. But the story that I wrote was very different. It's, 
I, it's a story about many, many characters. And in the background, you have uh, you have this like dam spewing in the background is this dam, but it's it's not like the main focus really of of the story. It's part part of it. It's a background of the story. Fantastic. So uh, I mean, like you know. Um... The story, as you said, like you know, the dam is the background, but it does put uh, together many other themes, like you know, themes of uh, uh, displacement, of uh, poverty, of uh, like you know, like uh, disenfranchisement uh, at the social level, and then there are equal number of things that you talk about at the personal level, right? Like you know, at the interpersonal level between the characters. Yeah. So how did you put together, like you know, like uh, like the uh, you know, like you have the broader themes, social yeah. themes. You have yeah. the personal themes and yeah. many of them. So how did you actually like to put all of these elements together into a story that would sort of mesh? Yeah. Um, okay. So you're saying like it could be different genres. This book could be a, a wide range of genres. It could be uh, historical fiction, contemporary fiction. So the only thing I have to say about that is it was just years of writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting. Um, you know, it started as something else. And then my a wonderful agent, Priya Goraswamy, she and I thought it should be something else. It should be climate fiction. So I turned into climate fiction. And then lo and behold, it's not climate fiction. It's a, it, 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 it's a thriller. Um, so, you know, putting these themes together wasn't something that I did consciously. Sure. It, it just it just happened because uh, the story was told in a certain way and um, and ultimately it fit in this genre. But I really don't think it's confined by that genre. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, okay, it just like yeah, there was a little freezing moment. Yeah. Fantastic. So uh, it, you know. Um, it does relate a little bit to the ambience that you grew up in, but you did fictionalize many things, like, you know, as you said, like, and you know, it uh, took off from that backdrop. So yeah. uh, how did you, uh, like, you know, determine, like, you know, who these characters are, what are the stories that you want to tell through them? How did that, like, you know, the, the crystallization of that story happen? Characters I created uh, were definitely created to um, fit into this whole, uh, you know, uh, this place is being submerged. So there are characters in 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 the in uh, in the book that are very connected to the dam. Uh, so what I have is once you have the um, you have the background, the nonfiction background, and then the fiction background includes all these characters. Only a few of them are directly connected to the dam and they are the ones who hold the book together in terms of balancing something real and something not. So Raj Nayak is one of those characters. He is really invested in the dam and he's anti-dam. And there's also there's the government employee, Samar, uh, who is a government official who doesn't like how the government is behaving and shortchanging people, uh, refusing to give them market value for so these two characters actually bridge the gap between fiction and nonfiction, and they move the story forward. Um, and I know this may sound silly, but the other characters are there. They are doing their own thing, but mostly they're just hanging out and chilling. No, I mean, like, you know, that's, that's fantastic. And you need like, you know, the other characters for the emotional part of the story as well, right? Like, you know, like uh, to uh, capture our, uh, uh, like you know, uh, attention in other ways. So uh, right. tell me a little bit about like another you know, process because I heard something as you started speaking that it was many years of writing and rewriting. So uh, you know, from that story uh, to creating like you know these uh, the prime characters like you know the um, uh, like you know like uh, uh, the pro and con side of the dam uh, like you know, as you're saying and the cast of supporting characters. From there, how did it evolve? Like you know like. Uh, um, Tell us a little bit about the dilemmas and the conflicts that you have in the book and why those specific conflicts, why those specific dilemmas? Uh, so, um, uh, so Amrita, the uh, conflicts in this uh, book are at you know, very different levels. There are really huge conflicts where uh, you, know, you have politicians uh, trying to use this dam as a way to make money. Right, and then there are other conflicts, just you know, political, but also on a very personal level. There's conflict 
in how people uh, conduct their lives. That you know they may be on you know, they, they may be moral people, but that they make uh, mistakes and they uh, go into this gray area where they do not act behave in a in a very honorable way. So the conflicts happen in many very uh, different ways. But I think. The, the personal conflicts are the most important in all this because it's a personal conflict that really carries the story. Uh, and yeah, I mean, everyone is flawed. And, you know, I want the readers to go away without judging any of my characters and just accepting that they're hugely flawed because that is what reality is, right? Yeah, actually, like, you know, that's the one thing that uh, really struck me as I was reading through the book that uh, a lot of them are great characters. And uh, yeah. so it's, uh, yeah, yeah. And you have to um, go with the flow with the fact that like you know, they are they have these shades in them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can't be one person is completely right and the other one is completely wrong. There has to be some um, middle path. Uh, and I did struggle a little bit uh, with making this happen because it's very hard as a, a you know as a writer or journalist to be so objective about your own writing, but. Yeah, this is one aspect I struggled with a little bit, but you know, it came came out good in the end. It it was fine. So uh, you mentioned something about like another you know, fact that this particular story, because it was so close to heart, it couldn't have been written as reportage or nonfiction because yeah. uh, you're yeah. uh, you can't be un, uh, unbiased in this. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, uh, but let's say if you were doing another story, uh, now that you've written the first book, I'm sure like you know, some people are asking you, what about the second book? Do you have the idea? <laughs> So if you have oh, the first book, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, um, um, would you think, you know, the whole genre of like you know, like uh, Amitav Ghosh kind of a book where it's climate fiction, yes, but it is really, uh, you know, fiction which is rooted in a lot of reality. Like you know, both his, um, like you know, all of his other books have been extremely rooted in uh, realities. Yeah. Uh, and then there is like you know the whole nonfiction genre, which makes it like an extremely like a thriller like. And one of my favorite authors is uh, Michael uh, Lewis, like you know who wrote yeah. uh, like the uh, the Big Short and uh, the book about the whole internet and high frequency trading and all of that. Like you know, which yeah. again like you know reads like a thriller. So yeah. uh, what do you think? I mean, like you know, how how would you compare like you know those two approaches if you were to look at a different topic? How would you choose? Well, I would well, choose. Yeah, I mean, how would I, you know, what you're saying is that he is able to take um, nonfiction and keep it nonfiction and still be a thriller. Uh, so here's the thing. Michael Lewis is Michael Lewis because he can do that. And, you know, Sena Gopal is Sena Gopal because she couldn't do that. So his, his skills are tremendous. And, you know, there are plenty of authors who can do that, but also he has a very deep, deep, um, uh, knowledge of these things and he's just remarkable because he just goes on and you don't even realize that he's uh, doing a thriller until like the end but the facts are there so I, I don't know if I can reconcile a bit too or if I can do that but I I, I think I would really be struggling with um, how to keep it objective sure, sure sure you know how to keep all this reporting objective if it's so close to my heart. I'm not sure that any of the issues that Michael Lewis, uh, you know, I haven't read much of him, but any of the issues that he dealt with, was, was there a, a personal conflict? I don't know if there was a personal conflict, but if there is a personal conflict, you shouldn't be writing about it as a reporter. You should be writing about it as, a, you know, a fiction. Sure, sure, sure. And also, I think it's it's like you know, a, a personal preference, right? Like, you know, I think you mentioned yeah. that it's not just about the uh, social angle, it's yeah, equally about the emotional angle of the story and the emotional conflicts that you right. uh, want to write about. So then obviously, uh, you right. have to be in that right. fiction, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, the other thing about your story uh, was the descriptive writing that you have, because it's really vivid. And we can imagine, like, you know, that we are in the place and, um, you know, um, outside in the village or outside in the fields or inside in the homes and uh, so on. So how did you actually uh, get down to this level of, like, you know, like uh, sort of uh, vivid graphic uh, um, uh, writing? Yeah. Yeah. Um so, you know, I think that would be uh, this, this saying that you can't, you can take the 
child out of the village, but not the village out of it, out of the child. So I may have lived away from India for more than two decades, but really, you know, my connections are not so deep here. They are in India. And it's interesting because th this whole life, right, that you see in the 86 village, it just seems very real. But, you know, I, I took it for granted growing up. I thought this is what it is, you know. People grow up in this, you know, beautiful village with these orchards and sugarcane fields. So I took it for granted, and it was only when I left India and moved to the West mm -hmm. that I realized that there, it, you know, my life in India was basically magical, and I never ever saw that. So about ten, twelve, you, you ask how I also started this book. So about twelve years ago, I started writing um, about all the you know, everything in India that I missed, in this village that I grew up in, Yadahali that I missed. Um, and then it just morphed into something else. So it's really not that hard. I also go to India at least once a year. And for, you know, I spend long periods of time. So um, I haven't forgotten. I've just learned to appreciate more and more. So it, was, it really wasn't that hard. Um, does that answer your question? It, it does. So, I mean, uh, you know, the other question then becomes, um, have you seen the changes in the village? Like, you know, is it as, um, you know, um, I guess atmospheric as you describe it, or it was atmospheric then and remains so in your memory? It was always atmospheric. And even now it is, uh, okay. though most of the village is abandoned. People have moved because of the dam and the waters that are coming very close. Uh, my parents still live in our house, which is about 300 years old. And um, the water is coming closer and closer. Uh, but, but I think that it, it's a little different now, but the place also is still very uh, vivid in terms of, you know, uh, it, it's beautiful. So instead of people, now you have like 200 flamingos in your backyard because the, you know, the, uh, the birds have started roosting. So it, it's a different kind of um, atmospheric, but it's definitely still there. Uh, I, and I always look for it. I, you know, I always look for it and I cherish it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I would be able to cherish it if I uh, lived in India, surrounded by it. I wouldn't appreciate it because that's what I would take it for granted. That's true. I think distance makes the heart grow fonder. So exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, it, it, it's close to your heart, but did you actually have to do a lot of research as you were writing the book? And like, you know, what, what is your process as a fiction writer to do the research that you need to do? So, I'm with that. So, the, the research, uh, especially for my book, where the background is so obviously a dam and mismanagement, corruption of the government, the research was not hard to do. Uh, you know, you can talk to a few people and you have it. And also I have a very strong science background, um, you know, and science background in agriculture. So it wasn't that hard for me to uh, do the research on that. It was a little bit tricky using that as a background to tell a story. But also, when, even when you're writing fiction, you can't be bizarre. Unless you want to create a world like Harry Potter, you can't be bizarre. It has to be believable. Uh, so the research actually helped a lot. I wasn't just like saying things randomly. You know, ev everything I said was valid. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the hard part, though, was that I used so much of my science background and research in writing this book that at some point, you know, everyone just told me, you know, it can't be so. It can't. It, this doesn't sound like fiction. It's this is not funny. It's it's not fun to read because all you're doing is giving us all the. Um, all everything that you found um you know you've researched so yes i had to keep dumbing it down to a stage where it did it, it didn't become the story like the research and the science part of it didn't become the story sure sure, sure. and i must say i mean like you know i didn't feel that that uh you know when i was reading the book that it had too much of science in it so yeah clearly like you know, it's been um you know like i guess uh synthesized well so that it's there but uh not uh, yeah just like in a subtle way yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, you know, what's been the reaction of uh, people that you know, uh, let's say in Bangalore and like you know, so on, where uh, such issues are, um, you know, they're still happening, right? Like, you know, water is a big issue. Yeah. 
right? And there are still like, you know, like situations like this, not this exact situation, but very, very similar situations are happening every year. So what's yeah. been the reaction? Yeah, uh, there hasn't been any reaction uh, from people in Bangalore. I don't know how many of them have read it. Sure. Um, but the reaction to people, you know, also it's not being published in India. You can buy it, but it's not uh, being published in India yet, and it will. Uh, but there's been no reactions from there. Most of the reaction has been from here uh, okay. in the United States where people have uh, read about it. And for them, this is something totally unbelievable that, you know, you can drown so many villages in this much area and, you know, leave people un not compensated. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, they're not just thinking about the dam because the story that's happening is is it it's it's also pretty gripping in terms of what all these characters do and how uh, how they screw up and you know how they just the human beings are constantly making mistakes. So I think that is what keeps most readers engrossed in, in any story. If you present ten people who are perfect, it, it's just not interesting. And what do you think of like, you know, the arc of the story in terms of like, you know, like uh, uh, redemp redemption versus non-redemption of these characters, of these great characters? And <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a place, right? Because uh, like, you know, in the end, the story has to end in a particular way. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. So redemption, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, you've read it, right? Um, so the police officer, the politician, they're not interested in redemption. They just want to do what they want to do. They want to uh, take bribes. They want to make money. Um, you know, there are other, so, so I, I don't think they're interested in redemption, and especially if it comes from, you know, a, a society that they have been using and that has, you know, uh, fallen to their uh, evilness. Um, so yeah, but the other ones, there are a few few characters who are uh, guilty, who know they're guilty, and you know who they are, and we shouldn't like talk talk about it openly. But uh, yeah, there's a few guilty, and they want to be redeemed. They want to be uh, uh, they want to be forgiven. Uh, it's just that it it may not be possible in certain situations for that to happen. Yeah. yeah. No, I think I mean like you know that's a, a choice, right? As a as an author as well, that if you keep it real. And if it's yeah. life, life, then sometimes that res redemption is not possible and tying up all the loose ends is also not possible. Right, yeah. right. exactly, exactly, exactly. You should want it. Um, if you, yeah, you should just want it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what in your perception of the world uh, makes you feel or makes you like, you know, uh, want to portray all of these characters as complex. Oh, what? Okay. Why? Because isn't that what Why? we are? We are complex. Um, and uh, I, you know, my experiences uh, are no different from anyone's, no different from yours or, you know, anyone on the street. Uh, you know, we are all complex. That is a given. Uh, the only thing that people might struggle with is, you know, we try to put people in two categories, which is good and bad, right? And and we do that all the time, especially when we meet some new people in, you know, in life and, you know, we want to categorize them and put them in these neat little boxes. And so that doesn't happen. And that was also my main uh, thing, but because I can be very, very uh, objective about people. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not taken in uh, very easily. And um, so it really helped because it was easy for me to write this whole gray area uh, that my characters inhabit. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably the easiest thing I did because I, I was not burdened with this responsibility of creating two kinds of people because that would have been really, really hard. You said that the book had been in making for a while, right? So uh, mm -hmm. what's sort of like, you know, your uh, process of writing or process of crafting? Do you sort of like, you know, like uh, uh, create a draft? Then like, you know, like, uh, do you have uh, uh, post-it notes like, you know, around you? Do you create, like, you know, like uh, uh, sometimes uh, when people are plotting, like, you know, they might do it on hand. Some people use like, you know, spreadsheets. What's your process? I just write. Okay. 
and, and you, you know, you may not believe this, but I just write. I may have a vague idea of a plot okay. and a vague idea of what the characters should be, but I'm more like an organic writer. I don't have any detailed plot or details on characters. And it's actually really funny that you asked that question because, uh, you know, typically I should be writing down everything about a character, including the height and the color of the skin, the color of the hair. I don't do that, but it was funny in one part of the story that one of the characters I created was less than five feet tall, okay? Oh. And this character could go through a doorway that was just a little bit, bit over five feet tall, right? And then at some point it became important for me to make this character bend and go through that, like bend like this, like a curtsy. So I just, I changed the height. <laughs> I decided, okay, if this person is going to be, uh, you know, five feet five and we're going to make the door taller than that. So it, it, yeah, it's just all these, I know it sounds silly, but you know, these are like little, um, little details and the readers will catch them. Absolutely, absolutely. Like you know, the details actually like, and I have to, uh, tie in for that believability. But um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, you uh, write organically. So and tell me uh, something that surprised you, because if you're writing organically, then your own writing and your own characters and what they do sometimes can surprise you. Oh, what I did with it and the characters I created. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, just while writing, um, the first thing that surprised me uh, but not really uh, consciously, but I know what is surprising is that I created this whole uh, brothel, you know, in a book without having any idea of where I was going. I kind of knew where I was going, uh, but that was surprising that I decided to write about something that I, I that I had not like really know much about. Uh, so that was surprising. The other thing that was surprising, I think, is the, when I said, yeah, that I, subconsciously I had a lot of information in me about corruption I mean how it works and how how people work together so there's corruption in this book there is a politician who's corrupt and then there is a police officer who's corrupt who works with the politician so all these things I I didn't really have um uh, I, I didn't know I, I didn't know I had this information in me and it's only when I started writing that I realized yeah I, I know all this and I know it from the past yeah I think it's it's the uh, sort of uh, absorbed information about the world, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. Uh, the uh, yeah. live in. So, um, you know, how does, um, like, you know, how did writing this book um, work out with the rest of uh, your life in terms of, like, you know, your, um, uh, the journalistic career that you have and, uh, like, you know, time management and things like that? Okay, so I have two kids, one now, 16 and 14. Um, and I started writing this book when my son, who's 16 now, was two years old. But I wasn't really writing it. Um, I wrote it for maybe two or three weeks a year. And then four years ago, I decided I want to finish it. Uh, so, you know, my career in journalism right now has taken a backseat until I get this off the ground because it's impossible to do both. Um, and, you know, that's okay. This is a huge project, right? It's not something, I mean, I'll probably be promoting it for years. So certain aspects of my uh, life have taken a backseat, but also I've had like tremendous family support from, you know, starting from my husband's family and my family. There is no one has ever asked, oh, when will you finish this book? And I think that was helpful because when people keep asking you that, you become discouraged and you think, oh gosh, am I doing something that's wrong? Um, should I be finishing this? So I think that was the big part of it is the, uh, it's just this un unconditional support. No, I think like, you know, that's fantastic because, uh, you know, it's such a solitary task, like, you know, writing that uh, sometimes like, you know, you need to uh, ensure that you remain in the right frame of mind so that then yeah. like you are, you remain creative and uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, yeah, you know, you mentioned like, you know, that you uh, could obviously like, you know, be marketing this book for a while. And I think, uh, you know, it's um, bringing together such uh, interesting set of um, conversation starters, I think. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit more about like, you know, what you're doing to actually market the book right now. Um, has it been surprising? Like, you know, did you realize you would have to do this much of marketing? Are you enjoying that part? And I think, um, yeah, like, you know, let's start with there, but uh, there's uh, like, you know, 
more to unpack there. Yeah, so um, I knew kind of that I'd had to do a lot of this, but uh, you know, I I don't have too much to do, but I have to learn. Like I, you know, today I had to, we had to figure this out, right? How are we going to do this? So these these are the little glitches. But no, it hasn't been that bad. Um, but also I have like an excellent publisher and an excellent um, agent um, mm -hmm. who are helping like, you know, me do this because they have the connections and I'm doing the smaller things. I'm doing the smaller things, uh, like going to libraries and making sure they can stock my book. Then like several, several book clubs where I get invited. Um, some places I'm doing auctions, they're auctioning my book to raise money. So it's all like these small things. It's not anything big, but I know this is going to kind of set the stage of where this book goes. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm happy doing uh, marketing even more than this. I just need to learn how to do it better. Yeah, and I think, I mean, like, you know, like, uh, uh, I mean, a book like this, uh, you know, it can invite a lot of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, like in a dialogue at different levels, I'm like, and I'm sure there is a set of dialogues that you're having in uh, the U.S., but in India per se, like you know, where uh, these, you know, it's it's not an event of the past. Right, similar events are still happening. Right. Yeah. So then it becomes like you know, not just a reflection of the past, but a reflection of society as it is today. Yeah. Uh, like you know, and, and a piece uh, that can spark a lot of like a you know, conversation and dialogue uh, around some of the very relevant issues that we face as right. society still, right? right. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, sorry. No, no. Uh, go ahead. Oh no, I just meant to say there are relevant issues, but most of these issues in India. Uh, you know, for example, a dam, it, it's a marginalized issue. You won't find any big newspaper covering it. And the reason I say this is 20 years ago, I, I used to write for a development news channel that was showcasing all the problems um, of marginalized communities. But, you know, the main newspapers, Indian Express, the Hindu Times, none of them were covering it. So these issues are still the issues of the people who are not visible. And the people who don't have a voice because they're not educated enough. And it's only when that changes is that we can bring this government down to its knees. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, like uh, it's uh, uh, not changed even today, right? I mean, uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. there are certain things like you know, in the march of progress, like in you know, a certain things like you know, remain hidden. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, uh, has the uh, like, you know, pandemic uh, impacted anyway like you know like how you're doing the outreach for the book are you reaching out to the uh, like are you doing live events for example in uh, the us no not yet not yet okay but also that is because uh, the events i've done were in, in you know on the west coast and i'm on the east coast so we're doing virtual events which is actually good because you know in the past we would have done only in person because we didn't know that we could do this through zoom so the pandemic has been really really good in that sense is it has just made everything accessible so now i don't have to think about like, you you're sitting in india right even like you know a, a year ago we would you would have wondered okay how am i going to do this interview um you know but now you know how to do it and i know how to do it uh, though i think the person connection is very important and i'm building that i think there is different um levels of uh how do you put it uh dialogue that you can have and it you know it ranges from completely virtual to partially virtual uh so that it, the pandemic though affected um work in some ways uh there's an international pa paper shortage i don't know if you know that <laughs> so there's not enough paper yet to you know print all these books um and, but the rest of it, everyone just so quickly went online that it ultimately it really helped. The, the problem with this is though, that we mean, I mean, never see any of these people in person that I'm being interviewed by, that I'm doing panels with. And, and I think that is the downside because that personal connection is gone. You don't see this person. You don't know how, you know, you don't know what, how, how they are really. Sure, sure, sure. 
Yeah, and, and like, you know, if you're meeting people in real life, there is always a pre and a post and then like get to uh, engage with the real person also. So uh, you mentioned like, you know, like uh, the paper shortage and uh, like, you know, the blend of physical and uh, digital books and so on. But tell us a little bit about like, you know, the entire publishing experience, like you know, as a new author, was it difficult to find the publisher? What was the process with the publisher? So I had nothing to do with the finding the publisher. It was my agent. So the way this happens is, uh, you know, Priya, who's my agent, uh, she signed me maybe three years ago. We she signed me after reading a, a, a manuscript of my book. So she um, she is the one who shopped around. Most publishing houses will not entertain unsolicited manuscripts, which means that you have an agent who will present it to them. So she did that, you know, and then there were some issues. We, I had to rewrite the book and then it turned from historical fiction. It became climate fiction because we thought that is what works better with the dam. And then ultimately it became criminal fiction. I don't know how that happened. It just happened. So, and, and yeah, Priya is the driving force and, you know, she's, she's just so dogged about everything and she gets things done. So um, she sold it and then she's still involved in the whole process. Uh, you know, she, for example, she hooked us up, you know, and, you know, these are, this is her connection. Uh, and I also have the publishing house is called Polis Agora, Agora Books. And I have an editor there, Chantel, who is amazing, who is absolutely amazing. Uh, so these two women basically made my book what it is, to be really honest. It, it was just like two women who did it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the whole editing process, uh... Uh, you know, it's it's like a meeting of minds and a meeting of hearts, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm gathering from uh, this that it was quite a positive uh, experience. I mean, there was a lot of chaos. Definitely, there was a lot of chaos. Like you know, uh, in terms of what each of one, uh, each of us uh, had, uh, you know, in mind. But it was you know all all really good in the end. And I'm really lucky because it's very hard to find. Um, someone who believes in your book so much and wants it to become uh, successful. Though, uh, you know, sometimes when the uh, book changes shape, as you mentioned, like and I went from historical to uh, uh, like in a climate to uh, thriller. Uh, as an author, you're very, um, you know, emotionally involved with your draft, right? So how was it like, you know, for you, that entire process of the shaping and reshaping, like, you know, were you, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a shift that happens. So how was that? Yeah. Oh, you mean editing and editing? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 You get better at it mm. and you just do it because, you know, my first draft was just, you know, it was, whoa, uh, there's so much information here. There's so many characters. It's so heavy on information. People will get lost. I mean, I, when I wrote it, I was like, oh my God, this is a brilliant book. It wasn't a brilliant book at all. <laughs> it was a book that like really pulled you down. Uh, you know, I, I think I introduced 10 characters in the first two books, but I was really struggling. I'm not a fiction writer. Um, so it was just editing and editing and just keep writing again and again. And I think the thing that everyone needs to know is um, you, you can't write a book and think that's it, that it won't change. It, it is going to change and people are going to make you change it. Uh, so I must have written, you know, maybe 40, 45 drafts of it. Uh, and, you know, that's a lot. And it changed every single time. Every single time I had to let a character go. You know, the term for that is murder your babies. So, you know, you have to let go of a lot of um, characters, a lot of scenes. Uh, a little bit hard but then when we finally uh, did it and I say we I mean Priya and I did it it really started working because we streamlined the story so now all that information I have is sitting there and you know probably I could use it in another book but we didn't use even 30 percent 40 percent of the book I first wrote uh, and if if it got published I think I would get horrible reviews because <laughs> it just it does not work <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't agree more because like, you know, that's, uh, uh, and especially like, you know, when we are writing for the first time, it's, it's one of those learning moments as authors and as writers, like, you know, that, uh, you know, drafts and uh, editing yeah. really like, you know, like sort of like, you know, sharpens the, right. like, you know, the writing a lot. Right. 
So, uh, you know, you've balanced obviously like in you know, different roles. So uh, um, what do you think like, you know, would be your advice to other authors who might have careers, family, writing? How should, what should they do? Just go for it. <clears throat> you know, uh, if, you if you really want to write and you think you're a writer, I think the only thing that's holding you back is yourself. I mean, no one is telling you don't write, you, you're not a good writer. Uh, at least I don't think so. And so I think you should just go for it. You have to take risks. I took huge risks with this book, huge risks. Uh, I don't know if it ever got published and I spent so much time on it. I was also reporting, but that didn't matter because this book did take up a lot of my time in the last three years. And I just couldn't justify it because the thing is I was writing it without knowing if it would ever get published. Uh, so that was hard. Uh, there was every chance that it would not get published. And I was putting all this time in it. So it's just that you believe in something, you do it, and you want to create something, then just go for it and don't let anyone judge you or hold you back. Absolutely. And as a, like, you know, like uh, uh, the second time around, it's easier because people have your history. But as a first time author, uh, it's your personal belief that, uh, like, you know, carries you through for, because they do want to see a finished full manuscript. Yeah, and, and you know, to be honest, people are uh, people anywhere in the world. Writing is not still not considered a, a, a career. It's not, you don't do it as a career, right? You do it because you fancy it. You do it because you want to indul indulge. You do it because you think you can write. Mm. So there's no, I mean, it's one of those careers for which you have to have no qualifications. You can be a high school dropout and write. Absolutely. And you have to go on your own compulsion, right? And then like, yeah. you know, second guessing yourself is yeah. like, you know, just uh, bringing your uh, own yeah. self. Down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, so uh, we're sort of like, you know, coming towards uh, the end of an hour, uh, a few minutes ago. So I just wanted to understand like, you know, like uh, any um, sort of parting messages for the young women who might be listening to this episode. Woman power. <laughs> Woman power is so amazing. It can turn the world upside down. <laughs> and the saddest thing is men don't know that yet. <laughs> so no, I'm just joking. But yeah, woman power, uh, you know, you put, I, there's nothing you can't do, as I said, and the only thing that's holding you back is yourself. But look at it in the last 15, even 10, 15 years, so much has changed, right? Even in India, in terms of, you know, the landscape has changed. You know, women are doing things that they did not do in the past. Like these, this young crop of uh, girls that I see there, they're amazingly confident. They're very confident. And, I, you know, I don't know, you might agree with that or not agree with that. So I think they're well on their way. And many of them will do things only that they love. Okay, there's none of this, oh, I'm going to, you know, when I left India, it was either you were an engineer or a doctor. Today, there's none of that. So really, the sky's the limit for them and hats off. <laughs> fantastic. So, Sena, I wish you all the very best. And uh, I think it's a fantastic book. It needs to be showcased. And uh, like, you, know, you need to create a lot of dialogues around this because uh, there are dialogues that uh, need to be had. Great. Thank you so much, Amrita, for your time and interest. It was great talking to you. Likewise. And you're in Bombay, correct? I'm in Bombay. Yes, okay. I'm in Bombay. Yeah, let me uh, switch off the live. I don't know uh, if I leave, then we'll end. Well, lovely to have been here. And with that, I think we'll end the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>